Oh, kia ora koutou no, it is uh, one minute past ten, 15th of June, Year of Our Lord, 2022, and good evening to Chewy. Hi Chewy. How you doing mate? Good man, good evening George. Good day. Everything well? Yes. Yeah, pretty good. Nice chill day. Um, we were talking last night Chewy with George, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but how George is like our farmer, you know, he's like, yep, good, sweet, <laughs> yep, man, a few words. But I did this thing the other day where I was looking to find some information from a clip we had made. And because I didn't quite know where it was, I put it on double speed. And I realized in that moment, what I like about George is I sounded like a chipmunk and he sounded like he was speaking at normal speed. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't told you that, George, but I thought it was a nice little uh, acknowledgement of your relaxed and laid back patter. <laughs> that when I doubled the speed, you were like, yeah, okay, now I'm speaking like this. And, I'm just not running. and I went and said, Bleh. So, I should probably good. acknowledge as well. Um, happy birthday to the both of you over the last couple of days. Mine's oh, yeah. on Saturday, so oh. we're, we're all very close in birthdays. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if our parents knew each other. Something about what was what, what happened <laughs> nine months before now? Was it like a it wasn't New Year's Eve or something? It wasn't that, was it? Maybe it, maybe we're Queen's birthday weekend babies or something. There's party time in the oh, in the, if I was in the elderly people to house. celebrate the Queen. I'll be very upset. <laughs> you'd be called you'd be called Philip if you were probably, wouldn't you? Something like that. <laughs> um, well, hey, how's everyone doing? I'm glad you're back with us again. Uh, please remember, as always, you are welcome to participate, be involved, you know, just chat on the. Uh, platform that you're watching us on but to be honest the best way to do it is on youtube so if you're watching us on uh, twitter or you're watching us on facebook or even twitch the best way to communicate with us is through face uh, through through youtube so you can head over to youtube um, to say good day and be involved if you've got any uh, comments to offer and also remember everybody that we are now also an audio podcast Every single night once this is finished, as soon as this is finished, we just rip the audio off this. We put it on to both Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And it means if you come in late or you leave early or whatever on any of these days uh, that at around midnight, not that you'll necessarily be up, or, some, or maybe the next morning when you get up to go to work, there will be an audio version of the nightly show that you can uh, put into your device and listen to at your convenience. So just thought we'd let you know about that. All right, team, what's going on? Anything going on, Chewy? Anything we need to know about? Uh, no, I've had a nice uh, chill day of, of, of relaxation and, yeah? and puppy play, and that's, that's been about it. Um, I probably needed it after your Friday night special. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I did enjoy that. I um, I had uh, someone question me on, on, like, why why would you talk to someone like that? And it's like, yep. how many people out there don't know that these guys exist or what they believe in? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the analogy of shining a light into a dark corner is, is probably pretty... A, uh, appropriate when it comes to those guys yeah i mean uh, for people who don't know what we're talking about i had a had a two hour and 40 minute for the love of god i i watched a bit of it as well i was in the chat room with people when they were watching it and i realized after about an hour that was the first time i said well we we can't go on all night we probably have to wrap up at some stage that was about an hour in we ended up finishing that conversation at two hours and 40 minutes <laughs> um and it was with a right-wing conservative youtuber commentator out of america called james i think is his first name surname is hake um and yeah it was just i i you, you know the philosophy of the podcast we like to lead horses to water uh you can't necessarily make them drink and he was someone who um needed some of his perspectives challenged in the world and the thing i like about doing that publicly not that i'm arrogant enough to say i can always do it um but because i can have it done to me as well as it, it makes people stop and think and even if it can't get through that skull today maybe an interaction with someone else tomorrow and someone else in a month and someone else in six months then it might sink in it's like 
leading someone to water doesn't have to be all in one hit. Maybe we lead some people one meter closer to the water as a part of their journey to get there and eventually drink. That's sort of how mm. I think about it. But in saying that, I do. There's, there's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't just talk to anybody and put any kind of views out there. But you know, he was one that I quite liked and quite enjoyed looking, talking to. Even though I obviously didn't like his his perspective on the world at all. Yeah, his worldview is pretty pretty fucked. And as as much as he's trying to dress it up as as something new and hip and um, you know, of this century, it's it's definitely just old timey religious extremism um wrapped up in some racism just to spice things up a little bit I, yeah I, I think he wouldn't have been out of out of order talking in, in the 30s to a bunch of people with um pillowcases on their heads yeah and I, I i said um i think i've talked to you about this too i said i was taken a bit aback when he told me about how he was quite he'd be quite keen to see 90 percent of america be white and i and, and he was fine with the white replacement theory that's when I kind of went, am I in over my head a bit here? Not not due to his superior intellect, but just like, do I really want this to be on our channel of conversations, etc.? I think it was okay in, in the long run because, you know, I think mostly he looked like he wasn't quite clear about what he was saying. The other thing I, I found hilarious was you can see when someone belongs to a tribe, how they really are invested in that tribe. So all, all over the um, YouTube comments channel now, there's all sorts of things like hakes on fire with all these fire emojis to which I pinned so a comment, weird. Well, to which I pinned a comment at the top that says something like, um, in America, the word fire must be a very different element to what it is in New Zealand. Because <laughs> 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 I didn't quite get what they were saying because, yeah, there was lacking in fire. So <laughs> anyway, uh, hey, look, it might be quite a good uh, way to get into our first conversation talking about uh, religious zealots and religious uh, and views from the 1930s etc etc so why don't we just rip should we just rip let's just rip um so there's a college in Tauranga uh actually in a area of Tauranga called Bethlehem because there's a place it in New Zealand Tauranga? called Bethlehem um which apparently gets very busy around Christmas time because there is a market for people to have their Christmas cards stamped from the post office at Bethlehem that people think that's kind of cute so there you go so Bethlehem College is a uh, a school, a Christian school, a ministry uh, school type uh, type place that has religious beliefs, and there's a little bit of controversy around them at the moment. Uh, let me just read to you this story, uh, the start of the story from New Zealand here, but I think we should also give credit to where this has come from. This is where I've seen it, but George, are we pretty clear that once again David Farrier was the first to kind of drop this? Uh, no, no, that isn't, that, that isn't necessarily clear, but a lot of the deeper re reporting... Uh, is, yeah, there's got that familiar story of um, David Farrier uh, reporting on it. All right. So the Ministry of Ed Education has warned it can consider, quote unquote, formal intervention if Bethlehem College does not remove a line about marriage between a man and a woman from a statement of belief if it asks parents to sign. The ministry also revealed it told the college a month ago to remove the line. The college says it is considering the implications of removing the line. <laughs> the implications. The world's going to fall down. Um, which it added in 2019 and says it was intended to be transparent about its beliefs. The Bay of Plenty Times weekend reported on Saturday that the school had come under fire from LBGTQIA plus advocates who say the line is discriminatory. The school statement of belief contains 13 points and enrolling students, parents or caregiver must read and acknowledge that these statements summarize key beliefs of Christian education trust and underpin the school's special character. I'm a little bit unclear. Maybe you've read this, George. Let me know if you have or, or, or you chewy as well. I don't I haven't actually read that if a, if a parent refuses to sign it, the kid can't go to the school like it's not. Mm. I don't know about that, but I, but because it seems like what they're saying is the parent needs to acknowledge what the school says they believe, not necessarily believe it themselves. I'm not sure on that, so that maybe that will come out as we as we talk over the next few days. The last point is quote: marriage is an institution created by God, in which one man and one woman into into an exclusive relationship attended for life, and that marriage is the only form of partnership approved by God for sexual relations the ministry said this point was added without its knowledge and must be removed so there you go there's the first part of it there's more that i'm going to read out from here but um it already sounds like uh chewy you're chomping at the bits to get in on this so uh away you go what was marriage 
created by God? Don't think so. No. <laughs> no. No, I if, don't think it was. In fact, um, I remember I remember having a debate quite strongly with a, a Christian ap apologist who made that point, and I went, because, um, you know, my upbringing in the Catholic Church, I know a lot of the stories and stuff, and I said, you know the story of Adam and Eve? And I goes, well, of course I do. It's the foundation of da-da-da-da. And I'm like, so when was the marriage? Like, I don't remember, yeah. I don't remember them... They you know, just I, I do, and I do. <laughs> they well, to, to be fair, that's just because God hadn't created um, suit hire yet, <laughs> so or um, was... or wedding DJs. Where was the yeah, wedding DJ? No, there's definitely no DJs, which I think was a massive oversight. Um, I'm always wary of stuff like this because, of course, there's there's a lot of funding that comes from the government for for state integration for these schools, and. I, I'm a little. I'm very, very wary if uh, the school is trying to contract out of any obligations that it has. Of like, well, we put it in a document, so um, unless the Ministry of Education noted us that straight away, we're free and easy with it. Um, yeah, so this any is any sort of it, state money that's going to this sort of bullshit. Um, that, that was the contribution from David Farrier's own digging around. Was that they they snuck in point thirteen after the. Uh, integration agreement with the Ministry of Education uh, and maybe it was his reporting that, that, that triggered them basically saying nope, you got to get rid of that otherwise um, you're not going to be getting the integration money uh, anymore and for those of you, uh, for, the, for viewers the integration basically, you know, replaced the whole charter system and, and, and mm. other system kind of streamlined it as basically the government when a school integrates uh, becomes a state integrated school. The government um, can fund s stuff like paying for teachers uh, in return for um, you know uh, the school following, following the curriculum, following the curriculum yeah. uh, and also you know not being dickheads or whatever it might be in terms of <laughs> this discriminatory <laughs> stuff. This is a clear um, breach of not being a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the school can be private. Uh, non-profit or for-profit when it comes to things like property, uh, land value, that sort of thing, real estate. Can I just also mention, um, it's uh, just so people are clear, not that you necessarily said it like this, George, but this is not a new thing. I mean, the Catholic school that I went to, Sacred mm. Heart College in, in uh, West Auckland, East Auckland, East Auckland, Glen Innes, that was called an integrated school, and that was in the 1920s, as we know. Um, and integration, the way I've always thought about it, was it's not a state school, it's not a private school, it's somewhere in between. Yep. It has private school attributes, it has some public money, the fees are higher because it doesn't have all the public money and it's somewhere in between. But I guess the point being is once you sign an agreement with the government to be, let's say, a wholesaler of their product being the curriculum, then you have to abide by their rules. And mm -hmm. if you're getting public money, I mean, they always talk about free speech and, and discrimination. That really only applies, not entirely, but mostly to government agencies. You know, I, I, can, I can't really discriminate necessarily against a, another individual, but, you know, WINS or, or the government or ACC can discriminate against. I mean, I can't obviously discriminate, but, you know, when I'm talking about from a legal point of view. Um, so, so once you integrate, once you come away from being a private school, you have to abide by whatever the law says. You can't make quote unquote special character rules for yourself. It's a bit like if you have a club, um, you can be a private club and be a, a men's only club. But if you're a public open to the public club, you can't discriminate based on sex. So you can't be mm -hmm. a men's only club. So, so that's what happens when you leave that world of being private, you have uh, rules and conditions to abide to based on, uh, the law of the land. And so that's yeah. what they need to do. Although they can, they, they can only choose, they can choose to only have people come into their school based on their special character, which is why I'm thinking maybe this 13 point thing is, a, you know, necessary for sending your children to the, to the school, because part of being an integrated school means that you can be like, nah, you can't come in or you can come in. Yeah, let's uh, read a bit more from the article. Bethlehem College Board of Trustees Chairman Paul Shakes said the school continued to hold mainstream Christian beliefs, including around marriage. This is a quote, because we believe they led to human well-being and flourishing. He said the point about the school's view on marriage was added to the statement in early 2019, quote, so that we could be fully open and transparent about our beliefs as other views of marriage emerged. 
It was important to the school that parents who chose to enrol their children had a, quote, genuine chance to understand who we are. He said the school was founded to provide a Bible-based Christian education, which was why parents chose to enrol their school, he said. Now, I guess my first point, well, not my first point, but about that, what he said there is, I don't think the government should be in business with religious schools. Like if the school is going, I mean, there are there are lots of organisations that are based around religious organ. Like think about the Salvation Army and how many how much good work they do. I'm not necessarily saying if you're a religious organisation, you should have to go it alone. But what I'm saying is if if your mandate is to educate people in your religious beliefs, you probably shouldn't be in partnership with the government and get government money from that. And then this would eliminate all these issues. Yeah, I guess that the state integration is a way of keeping checks on the curriculum, right? It's about a cohesive, sort of coherent national curriculum um, that that stops any sort of, uh, um, you know, discontent or dis, uh, you know, coherence uh, among, do you know what I'm saying? It, it means that the keeps the, the nation, education consistent yeah it's a consistency yeah. thing you know I, and i agree with that and i think i think that we sh- obviously we should we should do that it should be a part of what we do but what i'm saying is if if your if your personal religious mandate is to further your religious beliefs and that's what kind of these 12 points are talking about on some level then i don't think that's a good partnership for 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 government to be in with because there's always going to be these kinds of conflicts now I'll read one more bit before I, I heard the big uh, deep sigh there, Chewy. So I'm, 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 I'm just ready to get you back their in website. there. Uh, <laughs> one more, one more bit here. Uh, Tauranga Pride active uh, uh, advocate, sorry, uh, Gordy Lockhart told the Bay of Plenty Times weekend he viewed the line as discriminatory and against the Marriage Amendment Act, which enabled couples to marry regardless of gender or sexual orientation. He believes it would contribute to significant mental health issues in young people. LGBTQIA plus youth charity Inside Out also called for the line to be removed, believing it sent a blanket message of unacceptance to rainbow students and those questioning how they identified. Now, let me just say one thing. When it says up here, um, the, the advocate, he viewed the line as discriminatory. That's because it's discriminatory. But this is the public money thing if you are a religious organization you are allowed to be discriminatory under the law that's why for example the catholic church only has male priests they're allowed to say no women allowed because it's based on their religious beliefs the idea of being discriminatory we all discriminate and there is ways we are allowed to legally discriminate the problem here is because public money is involved that's when you have to abide by the public rules it was like when um same-sex marriage came in marriage equality came in churches all of a sudden realized that if they were going to hire their halls to the general public then they had to hire them to same-sex couples because you can't discriminate based on someone's sexual orientation so if this hall in this church was available to any joe blow off the street and jane blow you know not a member of your congregation then you weren't allowed to say to jimmy and jack you can't have it right so when you take public money or you're open to the public you have to adhere to rules however if you're a private religious organization you are allowed to discriminate based on your beliefs and that's what this is so he's right it is a discriminatory statement but that's because religious organizations do do that in this instance they shouldn't be because they're taking public money which brings you back to that point that it's not a very good quote unquote marriage pardon the pun for uh, religious schools and the government to be in business together yeah um I mean, I'd be very careful here not to slap around a very broad brush and say all religious schools are bad because they're not. I've had a lot of friends that have gone through, um, the, you know, the Catholic Church has a, a network of, of schools throughout the country. and Incredibly they a, sought after. People try and get yep, their kids into those They Catholic do a really schools. good yeah. job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I personally know someone who sent their child to a Catholic school and that child came out as trans about halfway through and <laughs> was absolutely terrified of the school's reaction to that and um they did by all accounts from what she's told me an absolutely stellar job uh, with that child so you know not all religious schools are packed full of um nut bars with a really black and white view of of what's going on but as you guys have been talking i've been going through their website and holy shit <laughs> it's it's uh 
I cannot imagine what it would be like to be a kid, say a young kid or a teenager, trying to sort out who they are in that environment. Sure. Um, you know, I, you know, if you were growing up that way with uh, some very religious parents and you were trying to conceal that and we're in an environment like this, you have nowhere to go. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, that's kind of aside from what we're talking about, the public money, but Jesus, that's given me the creeps. But it's, it's not really, because it's like, there's a group called Exodus, right? And Exodus are a group that started in America, obviously, who thought you could pray the gay away. You know, this is mm. this whole saying about that. All the people who founded Exodus have all re repented from that, turned away from it, apologized for the damage that it has done to people. Um, you know, the serious and significant um, issues it's caused people up to and including things like suicides by people who are conflicted because of their sexual orientation versus what they're being told they should be. So I, I don't question that this kind of school and this kind of rhetoric can be hugely harmful. That comes to the parents then though, doesn't it? It's like the parents have to decide where their kids are going to go, what they're going to do. And I wouldn't have my kid in a school that was mm. going to have harmful attitudes like this. And if parents do have their kids in the school, then they've got to understand because there's public money, maybe that's your safety backup, that they have to abide by the laws of the land. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it feels like that maybe the we need to have a hard look at the the uh, how state integration is uh, approved. You know, because I, I mean, I have a I have a similar experience in that I went to a, a Anglican school in Christchurch, and the religious classes were basically just like be nice to people, and you're special, and everyone's different, and you know all this sort of uh, vague, you know, uh, kind of liberal sensibilities, um, which is of course completely different to what we're dealing with here. But nonetheless, as we've been saying, a school like Bethlehem uh, gets the benefits of state integration without the uh, without the you know the the, the responsibility, the the, um, mm. the the return, the social return. Yeah, and so, certainly from the piece that I uh, read on um, David Farrier's blog, he's he's talking about um, almost what sounded like a an anti-gay rally happening at that school. Uh, with the kids jumping around yelling kill the gays and all of that sort of stuff which is real concerning so yeah i i, I hope someone's having a real good look at this place yeah um, just, well just... The, the school said they would investigate it Chewy, so oh self-investigation yeah <laughs> uh, consider myself calm just to have a look at the um the the david ferrier piece if people want to check out his uh, reporting as well webworm.co bethlehem college snuck that marriage thing in Sounds a bit dirty, mm. doesn't it? But there you go. Yeah, look, I mean, on one hand, I think, obviously, this is a ridiculous policy to make teach. I mean, I wouldn't sign that. My kids wouldn't go to that school, right? Um, but it's... it's the, Having public money is a good thing because it gives the society the ability to hold them accountable to the laws of the land. But the flip side of that is a, a private school can then do what it wants, whatever its special character is. I guess then as long as um, you know there aren't illegal activities going on in that private club, then that's what they want to do. But seeing so many of these groups want the public money, but they don't want the public accountability. And this is the public accountability part of the taking the public money. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You, you've got to go one way or the other. Go, go fully private and your parents pay two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a year in fees or integrate and abide by the rules that come with that integration. Yeah, no, exactly. Right, some messages that have been coming in. There have been quite a few, actually. Uh, Paul pointed out that perhaps all our parents got pregnant on la over Labor Weekend. I see Queen's birthday. Probably more like Labor Weekend, which would make sense, October-ish. That's, that's, well, know, I am just... a good uh, socialist, so there you go. So there you, so, go. So, so there you go. That's where um, that comes from. Uh, 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 <laughs> ben says, uh, so we if we pay taxes, that means we have less free choice than churches. Uh, no, I don't think we've got less free choice. It just means that, if they want to be a private little insulated, isolated group, they're allowed to have some rules that don't break, that aren't criminal, but also might be outside the re the remit of what's um what what people in public have to apply. And just remember, it's a really good example because when marriage equality happened, 
um, all the churches were going like, oh my God, we're going to have to rent out our places to these gay people. And like, actually nothing had changed in the law for that, for that to happen, because there was already laws that say you can't discriminate based on um, sexual orientation. Yeah. So therefore, if a same sex couple had to come to that church and said, we want to hold a birthday party in your publicly available hall, the church already wasn't allowed to go, you can't have that because you're gay. They already couldn't say that. And the thing that changed was the definition of marriage to include same-sex couples, not the laws that forced churches to hire their halls to said same-sex couples. And I know of people and I read of people. Uh, in fact, we were talking about um, Christopher Luxon the other day and the church he went to. One of them was the, the pastor of that church that basically said, I am gonna, I'm going to cancel my marriage marriage licensing certificate. I'm not going to marry people anymore if this law passes. Some of them went down that path, right? And some of them turned their churches into private clubs so they could turn people away. But there was there was no law change around what churches were and weren't allowed to do because they already weren't allowed to discriminate based on sexual orientation. All there was was, was an addition of same-sex couples to the marriage bill. So just to point that out and make that clear as to what did change and what didn't change. Um, so churches already don't have the choice to discriminate if they offer their services to the public, if they if the hall out the back can get rented out by the school or the, I don't know, the, the Rotary or Alcoholics Anonymous, then they can't say no to a same-sex couple. They've never been able to say no to a same-sex couple if they say no because they're a same-sex couple. Just They can find heaps of other reasons to of say course. no. Of course. It's like when people go to a job and they don't get hired, maybe it's a misogynistic boss because they're a woman. They'd never say to them, I didn't hire you because you're a woman. They might say, there might be the reason, but they'd say, well, you know, your skill set, you're this, you're that, another applicant. So they can get other reasons, but they just can't say it's because of that reason, which, yeah. And we have had cases of people where um, same-sex couples have, you know, taken to, taken to court some places who didn't overtly say no because you're a same-sex couple, but it was fairly obvious that 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 was the reason they were doing it. So you you, go, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, Ludwig says something about this sort of. You can't get a kosher observant diet in New Zealand prisons, only halal, vegetarian or vegan. Oh, there you yeah. go. A I prisoner am... in 2015 won the Surprised right to get kosher food um, after a human rights review tribunal. But other than that, yeah, um, apparently uh, not. Although um, I imagine maybe this case here um, could be used uh, for as you know precedent for other people that want kosher food while in prison. Um, I, but, yeah. I wonder how many uh, 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 Jewish faith for kosher isn't it? I wonder how many Jewish people who adhere to uh, requiring kosher food there are in New Zealand prisons. Not not saying that they shouldn't do it, but I just wonder what the actual number is. One. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, it shouldn't matter if it's one or one or fifty. No, no, I agree. Uh, I agree. I agree. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm surprised by that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I, I agree. If, the, if it's only one, it should still be able to get the, the food that they need. Um, but what I'm saying is, it's just purely interested mm. to me how many actual Jewish people there are in New Zealand prisons who observe their Judaism in a theologically religious way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people who, who are Jewish who who eat pork and you know don't really care. They just that's their it's more of their culture. It's like in South America there are a lot of Catholics who don't really observe the Catholic faith, but you know, like Argentina is a is a, is a Catholic country, so they're Catholics. Yeah, yeah. Um now George, you saw the Paddy Gower uh the Paddy Gower documentary that was on TV three last night about alcohol. I haven't seen it yet. I'm planning on watching it uh maybe tomorrow. I, I want to talk a little bit about a story that was on TV3. It was about Paddy Gower, about the drinking culture, and based off his documentary. Do you want to tell us anything about the documentary, first of all? Yeah, the documentary is, I mean, it's only like 45 minutes. It's basically Patrick Gower sets off to make a documentary about um, booze and booze culture in New Zealand. It, it's sort of unclear what if he's talking about youth binge drinking which seems to be a part of what he's talking about that why the documentary is a little bit off just in terms of its flow and structure is because it basically became a documentary about his own drinking mm. uh yeah. and and it sort of um quite authentically 
you know flowed into the the documentary world his his problems for example he got a bit too pissed uh well he got hit in the documentary he's he's off his face uh at the flat where he, in wellington where he used to be as a student uh and he's like real pissed around these students and these students are still you know it's still like early afternoon they're they're not drunk um <laughs> oh, shit. Which was the reason I watched the documentary. To be fair, <laughs> I, I wanted to see Patty, Patty drunk. Um, but yeah, so it becomes more about Patty's drinking, and it's it it's strange. Like it asks it asks us to to sort of look in the mirror about New Zealand drinking culture. But the stuff it's surrounded, but his journey is surrounded by in the documentary is more about youth drinking. Which when I think of the problem that New Zealand has with uh, alcohol is maybe not necessarily youth binge drinking, but it's the, you know, some of the statistics he does mention, like one third of crimes are alcohol related. If we think about the, you know, intergenerational uh, traumas and, and, and so forth because of alcohol, if we think of the mm-hmm. death toll on roads and, and that sort of thing. And I, I I was suspicious that it was going to take on the old, like, oh, look at these students uh, getting on the person and burning couches, which is, you know, the this sort of the, the B-roll that you often see in those sorts of... Uh, I think that's the B-roll in the story we're about to show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm real hot and cold on, on Paddy Gower, but I have been known to wax lyrical about New Zealand's drinking culture. Um previous i think you're right to say it's an intergenerational thing we came out of world war ii into um six o'clock closing um to horrific levels of drinking after work you got to get as many rounds in as you can and then stumble home and you're anglier and and beat up your wife because your dinner's cold that sort of thing um and it's i think it's a real hard thing to answer i think in a lot of cases it's counterintuitive um, that people want to crack down on drinking. I actually think it may be the other way. Um, one of the things I noticed when I traveled is, is you know, I went to a music festival. You go to a music festival here um, and, you know, your alcohol options are limited, expensive and policed. Um, I went to a music festival in Europe where the only rule around alcohol was no glass. Um, you could get um, beer quickly, cheaply at a variety of different places. And so you could manage your drinking better. Right. You know, you didn't feel like you had to go and, and sink as much piss as, as quickly as you can because uh, it took so long or, or it was hard to get. Um, so you had people that would just wander away from a band to go and get a beer and come back rather than trying to shotgun eight of them in the car park before you went in. Um, I think we see quite a bit of that in Dunedin with all the student pubs being closed and and that sort of thing. People going to an off-license drinking at a flat, trying to get as buzzed as possible before heading into town on the pubs. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive. But is our drinking culture so fucked that that wouldn't make a difference? So I, I, I think I'm going to have to give this thing a, list, a look. Yeah, see, well, maybe um, maybe we should all try and watch it. I mean, you and me, Chewy, before tomorrow night's show, and then mm. we can reflect on it tomorrow night. Both of us can answer yeah, good, parts cool. of it. I'm interested as well about what George has said, talking about the youth culture, and it kind of then turns into, as George has said, and what I understand, sort of Patty reflecting on his own drinking. Um, because... There's now calls, kind of sparked by this documentary, for there to be sort of let's relook at, let's relook at the drinking culture in New Zealand, yeah. And I wonder now that I hear uh, what George has just said, if it is indeed what we're looking at doing, or is this just marketing from Discovery and TV Three, putting it everywhere? Because actually, yep. as I as I hear you talking and I think about it. I don't know how much of this, although I did see uh, uh, TVNZ's Breakfast did ask, I think, Christopher Luxon about his drinking based on the back of it. So there was, you know, bleed over into TVNZ. But today FM did an interview with Paddy as well. But um, Tova, Paddy used to be Tova's boss. So there's a relationship there, even though the companies are no longer together. So I wonder how much of this is actually, it's time to relook at our drinking culture or how much of this is a push 
for a TV3 product that's obviously rated very well and they want to continue mm. on with it. Uh, let's have a look at some of the commentary. This is So this is TV3 News Tonight, News Hub, um, and it goes into Paddy Gower using some footage from his documentary and talking a bit about drinking culture. 1999, and there were queues on a Tuesday night as 18-year-old Kiwis now had a pass to drink booze. Legally, that is. Jenny Shipley was the Prime Minister and backed today, the younger drinking age. I went into a hotel and I was underage. But almost 23 years on... Here's the b -roll. Was it the right thing to do for New Zealand to bring the drinking age from 20 down to 18? I would do it again, and I would oppose anyone who sought to put it up. These kids can marry, they can have babies, they can go to war, they run companies. I interviewed Dame <laughs> Jenny in conjunction with my documentary last night. A few times I was a bit worried about you. I think she believes it is time for another national debate on our booze laws and has outlined specific policy areas to look at starting with supermarkets selling alcohol. I never supported that, interestingly. I felt that normalising liquor uh, with food was a, an error. She questioned whether alcohol mm. advertising should be more regulated. For example, alcohol is now packaged in what looks like kids' juice boxes, but they are vodka martinis with 4% alcohol. It looks like a juice box. A strawberry milk box, I guess, yeah. It makes me think of, like, the milk for schools. <laughs> we should have the debate on how do you create a culture where moderation is both achievable and sensible and accessible, and the push of advertising or accessibility is not persuading people to use liquor more than they would otherwise do. She also suggested a crackdown on those who supply alcohol to minors, including parents. I think we should look at the law uh, to signal whether supplying kids under age is clearly illegal and that those adults will be held to account. There you go. So there's the information uh, from the story last night. Interestingly, kind of almost echoing a bit what you were saying, Chewy, about the European experience and the drinking culture at the music festival. Um, that that you know, I, I also wonder about um, how to make it. Jenny Shipley saying a similar thing: how to kind of look at it and make it more uh, to change the culture of drinking in New Zealand is what mm. she was was saying as well. And you're describing a different culture of drinking. Uh, internationally than what we have in New Zealand. And I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't know how to change that. With the greatest of respect, I I mean, even though I was only in my 20s, I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of taking the drinking age down from 20 to 18 back then. I don't buy this whole, they can vote and they can do this and they can do it. Yeah, but people's frontal lobes don't develop till they're 25. So, you know, teenagers getting alcohol at that age, I didn't think it was necessarily a good idea as, yeah. as good as all I, that. I, I mean, the, the, the alcohol um, age law affected me. Um, cause I, I was turning 18 that year, I think. Um, and I didn't have my first drink until I was of age. I actually avoided, uh, alcohol cause it's a good boy. Just, just around the alcohol, but I was a good boy <laughs> around that. Um, and you know, I spent my student years drinking quite, quite heavily and, and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I worked in broadcasting where everybody drinks quite heavily. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's just interesting. I mean, I don't, are they saying that university students back before the law change weren't drinking? Well, I, I was a university I student. Were. I was a university student in the early nineties. Um, and there was a bar at Auckland university called shadows. It's probably still there. Don't know if it is. Yep. And of course, everyone in there was 18 to 25. Um, so it did happen before, and I know there's a, a, an argument that says, well, therefore, if you make it younger, that's fine because they're doing it anyway. But there is an equal and opposite argument that go, if you then make it available to 18-year-olds, it's more accessible to 16-year-olds, and did it. It goes on and on and on. So you can argue, argue both sides really easily. I guess I was interested in the idea of the change and how we're going to bring a change and how we're going to change the culture of drinking in New Zealand. And it seems to be I, one of those – one of, one, of, oh, one of those situations where one side will say – you know, legislation now, changes now, this now, this now, like maybe what Jenny Shipley's national government did by just going 20 to 18, whoosh, done deal. Whereas the other side may say it's going to take a generation or two, if it even, mm. in the, even is possible, which I don't necessarily think it is. Um, and if it's not possible, why don't we just stop all this horse shitting around where we're talking about changing a culture that's never going to be changed and get on with the problem that's before us with the drinking culture in New Zealand? That's why it's annoying that Jenny just turned up and said, oh, yeah, nah, maybe the age change was was a bad idea. Um, 
so alcohol related hospitalizations that sort of thing uh, did go up briefly um but since that time you know uh drinking youth drinking so 15 to 18 i think my stats are here has 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 plunged uh has gone oh, completely down um maybe because it's not quite as rebellious well that's also Binge. a good statistic for people who speak out against legalizing cannabis isn't it mm. um oh, for sure my my solution uh i would i would personally keep it at 18 for pubs and restaurants yep and then your off licenses your supermarkets and your liquor stores put it put it up a bit because i mean there you've got a pathway and i guess if you're having drinks in a more supervised environment a more social environment than an unsupervised student flat or something i can see that there would be a benefit in that there'd also be a benefit for venues and stuff like that that don't want to chase away custom but yeah, if if you could rock into a, a super liquor or something like that and purchase a, a full strength, full size bottle of whiskey and off into the night you go. Yeah. Um you know, is that the best move? Was well, I, was the straight from twenty one to eighteen without any sort of uh looking at how people were drinking. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was talked about was tax like on cigarettes. Like if you had to, I mean, I, I still don't quite get it that I go for a beer at a at a, a pub or a restaurant or a bar or something like that, and I'm paying 11 bucks for a glass mm. of beer. Oh, what the fuck is that? That would certainly be one way to control uh, binge drinking if, if they couldn't preload at the supermarket on sort of three lower alcohols and had to pay 11 bucks a beer at the yep. pub if they were 18. I mean, it could be, but then again, you know, there's always ways around it, but... If we took the attitude, there's always raise around it, like the NRA does. Was well, there's always going to be they're always going to be shooting people. Then you never change anything. So making some <laughs> changes is probably the probably the way. I mean, you know, I, I would certainly like. I, I'll be honest. I'd hate to lose um, beer out of a supermarket from a you know just a selfish convenience point of view from from me as well. And I often see a bit of chat around um, you know taxation, and one of the the things that comes up is like maybe like cigarettes they can control it through putting the tax up the yeah. excise tax goes up every year um but i remember someone floating the idea that they based it off um alcohol percentage and that was just like again i like my craft beers they're generally a bit stronger um <laughs> but it's your your 16 and 17 year olds aren't going to go out and buy some really dank fucking triple uh ipa um and, and sip on that in the car park going oh yes you can really taste the flavor notes you know the, as they um shotgun that i guess the question with alcohol as well is the difference between alcohol and tobacco is we do actually want people to stop smoking no one's suggesting that we just stop drinking people yeah. are suggesting that the, the the answer is doing it in a sensible way so as the chats are going on right now you can put some of those up if you want george about buying tobacco um i was literally standing behind someone the other day at uh, new world and they bought a, a pouch of tobacco and it was $86. And I was like, what the fuck? $86 for a pouch of tobacco. And I can see why people get pushed away from smoking purely based on cost. But we're not we're not saying that about alcohol. We're not saying everyone has to stop drinking, but we are saying everyone should stop smoking. So, so really maybe the $86? increase in tax is not the answer. $86, I saw someone. Right, oh, right. right. I looked up and that's what it was. Because I actually saw... I've so never been a smoker. And I went, what the fuck's that? And then I looked down and they had a pouch of tobacco. <laughs> yeah, I've I never stopped. been a smoker, but the last time I, I, I can recall hearing the, the price of a pouch of tobacco, it was about 35 bucks. Yeah, yeah, and that happened very, Damn. very fast. So that, that basically happened since I quit smoking only, uh, well, it's probably a couple of years ago now, that I used to spend, you know, $30, $40 on a 30 gram every week. Uh, and now that is pretty much, you know, once you got your filters and papers, pretty much a hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I guess it was a big part of me uh, quitting because I just, you know, I wouldn't be able to eat if I'd continued. I mean, this might be a cheeky thing to say, and I know people uh, smoke to relax. Uh, but how much is a bag of pee these days? <laughs> just make the switch. It's, it's, um, it's there's some people in the chat that I'm sure will let us know. It's, uh, oh, it's yeah. funny you should say that, Chewy. We've been approached by a new sponsor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, look, and look, I don't know. I mean, I think that's the big difference. I mean, they were talking about excise tax. The reason excise tax works on tobacco is we're actually trying to get everyone to stop. Mm. We're not talking about getting everyone to stop drinking. We're talking about how to drink sensibly. And that I don't think necessarily increasing the price is going to change that formula. So I mean, I so I quite the, like that idea about eighteen at the pub though and twenty for wholesalers and supermarkets. I think it's quite yeah, a nice it's got idea. A, it's got a little bit of nuance, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. come to the pub and fucking learn how to drink and see a live band. Because I mean, that's the other thing. And play well. pool like drunk. There's, there, there's there's side benefits to to having people go to venues. You know, you can have stuff like live music or stand up comedy, um, that sort of thing, uh, where you want people to be there, but yeah it's it's this double-edged sword for a lot of venues is that they've got to sell their product at a price that pays their overheads um and then they have to deal with their pub being filled with people who are drunk that have got drunk somewhere else um so yeah there's there's got to be winners for everyone but certainly when i was a student here in dunedin there were what six seven bars in the immediate student area um, and now there's none. Um, you know, you've got to come all the way into the octagon. Um, and the amount of people that I've seen commenting on the trail of destruction that students bring into the middle of town and pubs mm. going, well, these guys are on pills or they've been drinking in the countdown car park instead. Uh, you know, the, it, it didn't used to be like that. The, you know, you'd, you'd go to the Gardies or, or the university bars of um last mower or all of those other places that were there for students had student events were in the student area and it was much more contained uh but then the university went and bought them all turned them into offices yeah so yeah i i can see this is kind of where i get at when i say the university saw an alcohol problem and decided to move it rather than solving it yeah and maybe that's what that's what we're finding with the alcohol quote unquote problem in New Zealand is no one's looking to solve it, everyone's looking to move it. Move it you, down the street, move have... it down the generation, move it down the next year, move it to the next election cycle. Yeah. Just move it away from me. I mean, no one is suggesting that an eighteen year old straight out of high school, straight out of his hometown, away from mum and dad, is going to walk into a pub and start drinking with all the cultural norms already pre installed as he has a snifter of brandy and reads the sports section. Um, it's not going to happen. You have to. You have to learn. You learn from other people. You learn from your mistakes. Yeah, um, it sounds- and there's more chance of that happening in a supervised environment than in an unsupervised student bar with a bottle of whiskey. It sounds like these. So here, this some statistics here. It sounds like these. If you look at the studies, there's basically just a general sort of change in how drinking was just perceived by uh these younger secondary school students the the studied conclusion here just says that the acceptability of alcohol use decreased um but they couldn't find any sort of one sort of that's you know, real significant explanation uh for it because i mean I, when i was at high school i remember and this is before the law change um, I have distinct memories of uh, a mate of mine in school uniform getting served uh, at, at an off license. You know, some people give a shit, some people don't. Um, but I think with that law change, there was an increase in penalties and stuff like that. I, I, I think you're right, though. There's a, there, okay, so there's an example. Like, I left school when I was 17 because uh, I was very, very smart. So I was put up a year. So I was out of school when I was 17 and straight into um, AUT to start with in university. And I started drinking as soon as I was out of school, drunk four nights a week, went pretty hardcore. Mm. Um, and I was, although I'm, you know, six, three, six, four, big kind of looking dude. I was one of those kids, big red, you know, those kids have those big red cheeks. And so they look, <laughs> they look like an oversized baby, like just a grown up, a massive baby. That was sort of me, baby face. Didn't have, I like didn't have ironically any much facial hair, was kind of shaving once a week, that sort of thing. Um, but I, the first time, and remember, I'm not saying this out of pride of my kids are watching this, turn off now. Um, first four, I can tell you where I was those first, that first year out of school. Uh, Wednesday night, it was at Candy O's in Queen Street. Thursday night, it was a place, what was the name of the second place? It was called Keeley's or something, and it was $10 all you can drink. Uh, Friday night was Sight, 
And then, I um, know oh Friday night was the Coliseum, which is ironically now a church in what well, was when I was in Auckland in Monaco. And then Saturday night, we'd go somewhere, shop around and find a good deal. But $10 all you could drink on Thursday nights was in, in what we used to go to as well. Um, and um, I forgot what I started the story for. I was talking about alcohol. Oh, getting, getting uh, I, I was saying. Oh, the, and, getting... this, and the first time I was ever ID'd was when I was 20. Yeah. So that was 17 and a half through to 20. Never once got ID'd. And the first time I was over ID'd was at the bottle store in Mission Bay underneath McDonald's. And I was 20. And mm. I had a legal license. So I went for two and a half years drinking pretty hardcore. So to your point, uh, Chewy, it like depends what the establishment also wants as well, how they need to participate and take part in this because there's no way I look 20 because it was 20 when I was of that age. Mm. Um, there was no way. There's absolutely no way. I was 17 out of school looking like a, an oversized 15-year-old baby. One um, alcohol, please. Yeah. Yes. Can I have, can I have a beer, please, sir? <laughs> Here's so a note I, from my mum. So, yeah. So, so when you're talking about what we're going to do about it, there is an element to play from the alcohol providers, not necessarily the, the Lion Nathans of the world, but the guy pulling the handle and passing across the beer as well. They've got a part to play. I, I was just thinking, um, I see the comment from Simple Reality in the chat there. Um, which is being on. You look at the countries that have a better drinking culture, and I'm certainly not saying a, a perfect drinking culture because nobody ever is. But you know, Germany and France spring to mind as, as being ones that have a lower uh, lower limit before people can start drinking. Um, they have a completely different drinking culture. But when you look at England, Scotland, Ireland. Canada, US, Australia, us, uh, South Africa. We're noticing a little bit of a theme. Yeah. That it, it it's it, it's uh, something that's maybe going a little bit deeper than we uh, are taking at the first first glance is that they're all colonial countries. But um, yeah, I mean, that, getting back to me traveling around, um, uh, it was just real eye-opening about how differently we we handle things here. Um, and probably not to any particular point, but one particularly good story I have is I went to Munich for my birthday. Um, and, you know, this was an Oktoberfest, but it was leading up to that. Um, and I had my first beer at 10.30, uh, my second beer at 11, uh, before going on a walking tour of the Rise of Hitler. <laughs> um, we went to a concentration camp, which is not a great place to have a buzz on. Um, and then after that, I did another walking tour of all the beer halls in Munich. I think I got back to my accommodation about 4.30 in the morning and I had a, a flight out to Turkey at 8, 8 in the morning. I don't recommend any of those things. Um, I think we're going to wrap up the show shortly. We're going to talk about one other thing. It's a bit of a bit of a change, a um, bit of a change of direction, I guess. Um, but it kind of ties into a conversation that I'm going to have later on this week. So I think it's a good thing to throw out there now. Um, there is a situation in New Zealand schools at the moment where the schools are facing disruptions. I was going to say not because of COVID. Actually, I'll, I'll hold off on that comment. I'll say because they are lacking in teachers. Teacher numbers are down and um, it's starting to impact our schools. The reason I want to talk about this and I'll explain shortly when I go to the next article, is about a conversation we're going to have later on this week as well. So um, on breakfast this morning, a couple of uh, representatives, there was someone from the uh, Primary Teachers Association and the uh, principal of Onehunga High School was in there as well. Uh, so we're going to hear from the Auckland Primary Principals Association, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on with teacher shortages at the moment. Yeah, you know, we currently have um, very significant issues in schools um, getting qualified educators and relievers to cope with the um, increasing needs in our Auckland schools. Mm. So that's putting pressure on the staff that we do have. And we've got to um, be, look after the well-being of those staff because, again, a lot of our staff are coming back from COVID and they themselves are quite fragile. So that's sort of com compounding that issue. Um, I know it's really common practice at the moment to split classes, um, to share classes across other uh, teachers in the school on a daily or weekly basis if we can't find relief staff. And that's having an effect on students' 
uh, learning, and that's also concerning um, for teachers. Uh, so, yeah, some schools have had to move back to online learning or hybrid learning, and uh, or keeping year groups at home. And th that's it's also compounded by the fact that we can't get those sort of long-term relievers, or you know, uh, we have a maternity leave position, for example, and we can't fill that position. So I'm having to increasingly put more burden, if you like, onto the teachers that we do have. Um, so there's the goes on the interview goes on both uh, both parts that get involved in the interview to talk about other issues that are causing this teacher shortage um, that has gotten worse since the pandemic and that in 2020 there were more people applying for post-grade studies to go into teaching in 2021 there was fewer and there is a shortage happening now the reason I wanted to highlight this briefly is uh, there's a very interesting article in uh, the conversation as when the bias New Zealand urgently needs a COVID action plan for schools, here's how to do it. The author of this uh, of this piece, Dr. Amanda Carlsvig, we're going to have on the show either tomorrow night, Thursday or Friday night. Um, we're going to talk more about the COVID issue with her and what's happening in schools. But the reason I wanted to highlight it tonight was because this shortage of teachers is impacting other countries in the world as well. And one of the reasons it's impacting other countries is because of COVID. So mm. teachers in the UK are reported to be leaving the profession, citing lack of protective measures in schools and the impact of long COVID on their capacity to work. These reports should be ringing alarm bells in New Zealand, um, Amanda goes on to say. So teachers are overrepresented in the I've got COVID stats. Um, and because of that, what's happening in the UK, teachers aren't feeling as safe. They're feeling more at risk. And they're getting to a point where they're going, enough is enough, I'm out of this. So at the moment, with the government not giving good leadership when it comes to what's happening in our schools, unequivocally, unquestionably, there should still be masks in all New Zealand schools right now, but they're making the schools have the choice. What's going to happen is the teachers are going to say, we don't feel safe. I don't know whether that'll be half of 1% or 5%, I don't know. And they're going to say, we're not going to put our health at risk. And so the government, who are choosing at the moment not to follow the uh, epidemiologists and the medical advice around COVID, are going to be a contributing factor to this short, uh, this teacher shortage we're currently seeing being even worse. Mm. And the point that I wanted to make, and I and I haven't said this publicly, not that it's a, a big thing, but I haven't heard anyone else say it yet either, is we have a government agency called OSH, Occupation Safety and Health. How the fuck? Can keeping teachers safe from COVID at school not be a breach of OSH requirements? This government is going to be facing more teacher shortages because of their ineffective leadership today. And what that means at their next election is National is going to be able to say to them, well, look what you've done to our schools. All the teachers have gone. And the reason they're going is natural attrition and also some not feeling safe. I know teachers that have bought their own air purifiers because they're worried about COVID and the schools and the ministry aren't supporting them. Yep. So that was 100%. sort of a, a rant that I had, but yeah, go, go, Joey. You're welcome. No, uh, uh, look, I, I think, you know, they basically just let it rip in schools and it was always going to be the teachers that were going to be on the front lines of that. And I, I remember people as far back as January going, well, what are we going to do in the schools come winter when they can't have their windows and their doors open because it's too cold? Um, you know, the, the, that six months that the ministry could have been looking at air purification and, and ventilation and, and, and that sort of thing. But the fact that this, they haven't been going, yes, okay, we need masks in schools, in my mind is probably what's kept this pandemic bubbling over here in New Zealand, that we got so close to getting, getting rid of it and then we took the lid off it a little bit too quick and the schools were a big part of that, that bubble. Um, yeah. I don't think the the excuse of like, oh, well, we can't police mask usage in the students. I, I don't buy that. And that, that comes down to the schools themselves. But also the ministry has not given them the tools and the guidance to to say, well, actually, yes, you can. Well, of course you they can. can. And maybe that. George can speak to this if he went to an Anglican school. I know when I went to a Catholic school, if my socks were around my ankles, pull your socks up, boy. What's the difference? Pulling your socks up, tucking your shirt mm. in, putting your mask on. Of course they can police it. It's, yep. a, it's a lack of will, and I have said this before. Um, the, the principals that I know of in, in Dunedin who have said, 
uh, we're following ministry advice. Um, unfortunately, the ministry is not following epidemiologists and the health professionals' advice. And they're saying, we're not the experts here, the ministry are even though the ministry is giving out bad advice. And I know that because every epidemiologist we ever speak to, and George, you'll confirm this, says to us and says to you who are watching, um, I mean, go and have a listen to the Anna Brooks conversation that's on the, see down the bottom of the screen? It's, it's on a, as a podcast right now. You can listen to it. They're all saying the government is not doing what they should be doing. They're playing politics with this now. And and it's just, it's 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 ludicrous what they're doing because what it means is that the 13 year old at intermediate school if the principal and the board won't be the experts they're making the 13 year old be the expert because it's the 13 mm. year old who ultimately is deciding whether they put their mask on or not even if mum and dad say go to school and leave your mask on when they're at school in a situation where the school is either wear it or not and they choose not to wear it the 13 year old is therefore making public health decisions and mm. that's ridiculous <laughs> And then potentially catching COVID, taking it home to mum and dad. You take, you know, they get sick, they're out of the workforce. There's got to, you know, if you want to look at the economy side of things as well, you know, they're, they're bringing it back to the homes and taking people out of work. And, you know, there's, there's heaps of ways that you could look at this and go, ah, we can do better. Yeah. Hey, look, um, George, you want to add to that at all? No, nah, she's right. Nah. No, nah, she's right. Nah. Um, because I advertised that we were going to talk about it, I do want to cover off one thing. We'll do it. I, I'm, I'm not being flippant with this because it's a serious issue, but we'll just cover it off in a couple of minutes. There was a report out tonight, I, I believe, from the Official Information Act, got some reports that there's been an 87% jump in the number of calls to police for threatened or attempted suicide in the past six years. The organisation received just under 30,000 calls last year alone there was also a 66 percent rise in the number of mental health related calls but police were only able to respond to less than half of these police have told one news they're increased training for staff but that uh that, that they're not experts and this comes back mm. to that whole defund the police thing as we've talked about before defunding the police is not what people are suggesting when they say defund the police they're talking about reallocating the funding not just getting rid of it altogether in america the suggestion by some is there should be you know, mental health specialists that go out to a mental health situation in the community, you know, beside the police officers, not necessarily sending a nurse into a situation by themselves, but to have a way that we can allocate our, our public money to make, because what we want is the best outcome and the best result possible. Um, so this is the uh, the graph that TVNZ used tonight. The figure, uh, figures obtained by One News under the Official Information Act show calls about mental health on the rise. Now, my question, and I wonder if this does tie back at all to the alcohol conversation we've just had tonight, because, you know, you, you drink a bit much, you get a bit sad, you do something silly. Because whilst the calls for mental health issues and suicide have gone up, according to the facts and figures that we saw at the end of last year, suicide rates are actually going down. So, okay, end of conversation, dumb. Time for speculation. Um, I wonder if suicide rates have gone down because calls to the police have gone up. Maybe police are now interacting and getting there and, and helping people not take that horrible and drastic end step. Mm. I don't know. Or is it that um, more calls are being recorded as that now and maybe the number of mental health issues and suicide attempts aren't going up, but the calls to police are going up. I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting almost juxtaposition where we're being told, and I'm not, when I say being told, I'm not questioning these stats, obviously, that the uh, mental health situations are on the rise to police at the same time that suicides, and that's not just mental health, but suicide numbers are going down. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've seen a couple of, uh, I mean, obviously anecdotal um, comments about um, people trying to get through to uh, the, the suicide helpline and that sort of thing and, and being told to ring back later or very long wait times and, and that sort of thing. So maybe if if you're in that frame where you, you are scared for yourself and you do reach out because you're worried about something that you do and you're told that there's a 45-minute wait or call back in business hours, um, you know, lifeline and that sort of thing, that your next step is I'm calling the cops. Yeah, right. Um, you know, the, the I, well, I'm not sure if this is the right word, but the heartening thing is I'm glad that frontline police are getting more training uh, on how to deal with these situations because, as you said, better outcomes. 
Um, yeah. I, I can't imagine what it would be like walking into a situation like that with with very little training. Um, yeah. There's know, a bit of a stopgap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's really interesting to look at. Uh, you know, everyone in this country has had a tough couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised if there, there is mm. a spike of 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 people, you know, that are worried about what they might do. Yeah, couple that with like the the recent uh, understaffing when it comes to um, uh, social workers and and that sort of thing, uh, mm. the the strikes that they are on as as well, which um, they're more than entitled to do. Uh, then yeah, it's 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 not a great uh, recipe. I know of, I know of organisations here in Dunedin that not too long ago had had twenty staff, uh, and now they have like four. Um, yeah. part time you know yeah and, and i mean the, the the people that do man those helplines you know if, if that's the staffing that they're looking at and an already incredibly grueling job uh, you know the people that do those sort of jobs are by their nature very empathetic people but you know you use up all your empathy on other people the the burnout rate the, the stress that they are under, are they getting the right amounts of support and funding mm. uh, that they need? Is that something that needs to be looked at as well? You know, it's uh, there's no there's no one solution fix to it, unfortunately. Yeah, no, we a... are in a run up to an election, which means that there should be. <laughs> yeah, there'll be lots of one off fixes. <laughs> yeah, those those organize those high those helplines are like. Um you know, part of a, a greater network of organizations, like I mentioned, the the social workers, like, for example, in uh, Dunedin, I know that the local uh, addiction specialist uh, service have also lost, um, you know, like 80% of their staff wow. uh, over the past couple of years. So, like, it's a whole, like, matrix of organizations that, you know, um, when one fails, it puts more stress on the other. Hmm. I think it's, I think it's good that this is highlighted though as well because, um, I think most people, like when I was a lad, um, as we've already detailed in the nineteen thirties, um, you just didn't. This wasn't such an open and honest conversation. That was only you know a couple of decades mm. ago. Mm. Whereas now, I mean, I, I remember, I remember the change when I was working in radio where we didn't mention if a death was suicide or not. There were code words we used to use in the news, like police are seeking no one in association with this death, or there'd be, mm. uh, you know, has not died under any mysterious circumstances. There was codes, and and now there's more of an open and honest conversation around things like suicide. And obviously, the reason I've got the the image up there is because if we're talking about it, and someone needs it, then we look at look at what we've got to offer, even if they are a bit undermanned and not as much. I mean, in the in the 80s and 90s, you might have had one, it might have been Youthline. That might have been it. Whereas now you've got the the text one. Uh, you know, every time I'm, I, I I speak or see a counselor involved with teenagers, they're giving out these cards. Give this to your kids, and if they ever need to talk, they just text this number. And you know, so it's a it's a different world we live in. Not to say it's a it's a sorted out, complete, no problems world, but yeah. um, part of the reason it's good to talk about it. And obviously, I'm just realizing we've also got Apple Podcasts and Spotify Spotify going on. So what we have up on our screen at the moment is a bunch of um, phone numbers. For where to get help, including uh, the free call or text one one seven three seven at any time, and Youthline at 0800-376-633 and a bunch of other ones as well. So I'm not trying to minimise what's going on, but I'm like it's different in 2022 than it was in 1982 to talk about these sorts where, of things. Where do you remember there being a real switch? Because for me, I remember there being lots of talk around John Kerwin. Right. And, really and his struggles with depression and stuff like that. And and that got through to me as I've never been interested in sport and especially rugby. Mm. But that's probably what mm. I remember as being the, the first time I saw conversation in the media about depression and suicide and stuff like that. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure. Um, I think my first interaction with it was um, people I knew close to me who were going through yeah. it because as a kid I was always like you know depression well you're a bit sad are you you know didn't really have an understanding for it and stuff I'll oh, just harden up mate yeah but then just harden up. but then meeting people in my life who I you know know and 
relate to and love and that kind of stuff who explain what it is. Like I've had someone explain anxiety and I've told the story before on this show who explained anxiety to me before. Now I've, I've emceed concerts that have had 30,000 people there. Right. And mm. before you step on stage to MC that concert, your stomach's going, brrr, everyone, you know that feeling like if you're about to get married and you're waiting for your bride to come in or if you're bride, you've got those nervous butterflies and stuff. And someone explained to me anxiety once was um, that never goes away. Imagine having that all the time. And I was like, fuck, it was a real sort of eye-opening experience for me to think about the, the, the adrenaline and the agitation going through my body when I was about to go and MC the 30,000 people what that would be like all the time would be horrific. So, you know, I think my experience of it is speaking to people I know and love over the last probably 20 years who have had these issues that I didn't really experience growing up as a, when I say experience, I mean, didn't have in my circle, at least that I knew of as a, maybe a bit of a sheltered Catholic schoolboy. I, I once had anxiety explained to me um, in terms of a video game, when you're in an area and you hear boss music, boss battle right. music, right? And you can't see the boss. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that would suck, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely had people in my life that have have unfortunately taken their life that way. And, you know, I look look back and go, you know, were there signs, were there things that, that you could do? But it, at the end of the day, that, that person needs to feel like that they can reach out and hopefully um, – you know the the messaging around this and the change in people's attitudes means that 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 they can that they feel like they can because i I certainly mean thinking back to uh, a friend of mine that i lost when i was in high school he certainly didn't feel like he could reach out to anyone mm. um and you know that that was the option that he took and look one of the things i realized uh, when I started to get into media and one of the jobs I did, which was, you know, doing talk back where you were keeping people company during, and, and mine was the, the kind of nighttime, overnight time. It's like you're keeping people company as they also opened my eyes to what was out there and what people were going through, because we were the voice that you know, kept a lot of these people company mm -hmm. through the middle of the night sort of thing. And look, I'll be honest, not to try and spin this into a little advert for us, but this is one of the things I love about what we do. We can see you guys, and we can see the community building up slowly around us. And I'm not saying anybody that's watching right now needs us in this way or whatever, but I, I want to be something that can be companionship, company, source of information, source of news, source of entertainment for people, because it's it's through community, I think, that um, you're not going to get the, shit, I never knew that person was in that state. I could have, if I'd have known, I would have done something. It's like what authentic, deep and meaningful relationships and um and community is the thing that stops that thing from potentially happening you can't stop them all but from potentially happening and one of the things i love most about what we're discovering in this at the moment is seeing some of those same names popping up you know and asking mm. some of the questions some of the people who come up and say morning boys or evening boys first time every night you know it's i like that kind of stuff and i like to think that i'm not arrogant enough to say that we can help in this area but that we can be a voice um to a voice into the night keep people company you know, to say g'day, to be your mates, to tell you about what fucking awesome stuff and what terrible stuff's going on in the world today and do it with a smile on our faces and and be here. And when we get a chance to talk about this kind of stuff, we'll not only talk about it, but also, you know, as, as is on the screen right now, maybe give you some resources if you need it a little bit as well. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> yep. that's me. I'm done. <laughs> Nothing more to add there. <laughs> okay, I'm done. All right, I think that's us, guys, because I have to go turn this into an audio podcast now. So remember, as you see rolling across the bottom of your screen, subscribe to our uh, daily audio podcast. You can do it on Apple uh, Podcasts. You can do it on Spotify as well. Head to either of those platforms and just search for hashtag BHN or just look up Big Hearing News. Uh, you will see that logo in the in the corner over there. That'll pop up. That'll be actually uh, very easy to find, especially if you look at us on Apple uh, Podcasts. Um, a rate and a review would be really useful. People rate us and review us, especially a good one. Um, that helps the algorithms find us and uh, sends out stuff to other people as well. So as we always say, sh hashtag share our shit. Uh, if you're enjoying what you're uh, experiencing at the moment with what we're putting out there, the best way you can help right now is to is to tell people about us. Tell people about what we're doing. Share our stuff. Follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you follow us on Twitter, you get the clips and stuff that come through. When the clips and stuff come through, um, then you can share those out as well and, and, and tell people to come and join us weekdays at 10 p.m. for Big Hairy News. All right. Anything else, boys? Because I'm done. 
No, that, that's that's me. All right, team. Be safe. If you if you're going to be here tomorrow night, try and watch the Paddy Gower doco before tomorrow night. Mm. And and me and Chewy will commit to watching it uh, t- uh, before 10 p.m. tomorrow night. And if you're watching and you haven't watched it, try and watch it before tomorrow night. And then if we talk about it tomorrow night, you'll be able to participate. All right, team. Cheers, everyone. Um, love you to bits. Be safe. We'll see you tomorrow night.